Okay, welcome to the GPSA uh, webinar for the first one for 2016 at this stage. Uh, and you've joined the tips and tricks for new and not so new supervisors. As we've seen from the registration, we had 110 registered for tonight's uh, webinar and not all of you are completely without experience. In fact, quite a few of you have quite a bit of experience. Uh, nonetheless, the topic is tips and tricks for new uh, supervisors. And we have with us Dr. Simon Morgan. Welcome, Simon. <laughs> Thank you very much, Glenn. Now, just to be absolutely certain that people can hear us and uh, can see us, can I just have somebody pop a comment in the chat box, which is located down here? Loud and clear? Perfect. Rightio, we shall get cracking then. Throughout this evening, uh, you'll have the opportunity, obviously, to say g'day in the chat box and uh, to ask any questions that you would like. And uh, let's see how we go. Okay, obviously, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and sea on which GP supervisors work and live. And we thank you for all being here tonight. My name is Glenn Wallace. I'm the CEO of GP Supervisors Australia. And GPSA uh, will not be a stranger to most of you. In fact, uh, obviously, the webinar series, the guides, etc., all of the resources for GPSA are member-only resources. So if you've signed up for the first time for this webinar, you have become a member and uh, we thank you for joining us. GPSA are the representative body of uh, GP supervisors by promoting recognition for registrar supervision work through open and accountable ad advocacy. Members like yourself have uh, let us know that the three key things that are important to you are that GP supervision is considered rewarding, respected and above all else, uh, else is uh, recognised. We make sure that uh, your role is recognised and supported through webinars, guides, frequently asked questions, but we also have a number of surveys. Uh, we have a survey that's just about to go out that will gauge your views on the current NTCER. 2016 is a negotiation year for the, uh, the national terms and conditions for the employment of registrars. And we'll also be asking you about uh, your support for uh, received from uh, your regional training organisation and your training practice agreement as well. We have a range of guides that are currently available. We have another one that's coming out very shortly within a, in the next couple of months, and that is supporting the, under, the uh, underperforming GP registrar. So we hope that you will be interested in that and uh, look out for that as it uh, comes along. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started tonight. You'll notice that you are completely muted and that uh, you can't talk to each other. As you can imagine, as tonight progresses and we have more and more people joining uh, those late stragglers, uh, having 100 people talking in the background could make for a really unruly webinar. So you are muted, but you can obviously ask questions uh, and uh, please do so in the chat box down the, the bottom left there. Now, any questions that are unanswered uh, will be shown in red and any questions that have been answered will be shown in green. That just helps us keep a track of what questions have been uh, asked and, uh, and answered and uh, make sure that we get to as many as we possibly can. We are recording this webinar, so for those that uh, were unable to make it tonight but that uh, really wanted to, you will be able to see it. And those that uh, find something really useful and can't remember exactly what the words were, you'll be able to see that as well. Now, there's nothing worse than having somebody read out slides, and you've all seen the biography for uh, Simon Morgan tonight. And in fact, Simon's not a stranger to most of you. He's uh, been around these parts for quite some time. So I'm going to allow Simon to quickly introduce himself and uh, start his session. Well, thank you very much, Glenn, and um, thank you all for inviting me along. It, um, I say this at the beginning of every supervisor session I've uh, ever done, and I say it with um, great sincerity. But you know, the supervisors are very much the backbone of GP training, and without your um, ongoing contributions, it would all fall apart. And 
Um, I've, I've worked in GP training now for 15 years or so, and I think sometimes we kid ourselves that the the very small opportunity we have um, to I'm seeing too soft to hear, so I might see if I can turn that up. Um, <clears throat> the small opportunity we have to uh, talk to registrars at uh, the educational release workshops, um, we kid ourselves that that's the guts of their training. Um, but of course, it's really what happens in the practice with you guys, your mentorship, your supervision, your teaching, your assessment, your feedback. So it's, it's always fantastic to be able to, um, to talk to a group of supervisors. So as my uh, very potted bio there says, uh, I'm not a Matt Respected, I'm a GP, I'm a medical educator. I live currently in Newcastle. Um, my background uh, as a GP registrar, I um, finished my training up in the Northern Territory um, <clears throat> after being placed in Whirly Whirlingjang Aboriginal Medical Service in Catherine. I um, suddenly, within about two weeks, as a senior GP registrar, found myself as a senior doctor in the organisation when the supervisor promptly left. And it was a fantastic experience, actually, after um, uh, getting used to it. And that old adage of going up to the Territory for a few months and then staying there for 10 years was the case for us. And we are up there a long time, and that's where, in fact, I met Glenn through NTGPE. I also had the opportunity um, to work in Ireland for a couple of years in, in clinical work and in GP training and to see another system there. And I think that's influenced a lot of the way I've taught um, registrars and taught supervisors about teaching registrars. So hopefully I can bring some of those <coughs> experiences to, um, to this session tonight. As it says there, I'm very interested in supervisor professional development. Uh, I've been lucky enough to have some stuff published on that. And I'll refer to some of those um, papers. And the way I've always written uh, articles uh, has been very much practically and for for the use of, of the audience, for supervisors predominantly. So Glenn's written their random case analysis, which I'll refer to. We wrote a paper, very basic, but but fantastic, hopefully, for, for teaching and for new registrars around consultation skill tips. And I'll cover some others as we go. Can I also just acknowledge um, that we're meeting on a whole breadth of lands of uh, Aboriginal people and pay my respects to them as well, uh, elders past and present, because that's um, <clears throat> very much been part of my experience as, um, as an educator. So let's get started. Um, as Glenn has said, I, uh, I'm not used to doing webinars to this size audience. I've done a lot of uh, online and teleconference teaching um, but usually have the uh, luxury of people interrupting and asking questions, so it does feel a little bit odd speaking into the ether, but um, he's invited lots of questions and he's also going to interrupt and ask some, and please um, uh, ask your questions as we go, <clears throat> so it's not just me um, um, uh, ask your questions as we go, <clears throat> so it's not just me um, rabbiting on. These are the learning objectives, there's five of them, um, and hopefully they will meet some of your needs. I also um, am aware many of your experience, some of you may be very new to the game, but others have been working in this field for, for many years and, and will have a, a breadth of experience that, um, that you've, uh, you've gained. Hopefully I will try to focus on practical tips and tricks and make this um, something that you can actually take away and use. So when you think about, well, when I think about GP supervision, <clears throat> I think about the roles and responsibilities. I think about the opportunities for teaching um, in the practice and, and beyond. I, I think it's important to consider how registrars plan their learning. Um, this notion of uh, opportunistic teaching versus what you might do in a, in a structured educational session. And also, of course, it, uh, delivery of, um, of feedback. So they're the areas will cover. There's an alternate view of learning objectives and that's this. Uh, and, and again, this is my first um, opportunity to pose something that I hope is at least vaguely amusing and not hear any laughter, but that's the way it'll have to be. Uh, so, you know, people say, oh dear, it's so dry. Why do you always have to start these talks with learning objectives? Now, I'm, a guess, I guess, a bit of a traditionalist. I think it's important, but I guess I'd, I'm trying to model what I'd like you guys to do, thank you Danny B, um, to, uh, to actually 
make it very explicit what you intend to teach your registrars if in fact that's what you're setting out to do. And one of the tricks, one of the tips, and I guess one of the really important take home messages from this talk today is to try to articulate what you do. Articulate your thinking and articulate um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So too, all too often we, we teach and there's an expectation, we think we know what we're trying to get the registrar to understand, but it might not be what the registrar actually hopes to, uh, to, to take away. So let's get into the meat of it. I've got some cheat notes here as we go. Um, so this is a definition of supervision. It's old now. Uh, what's that? Getting on to we're getting on to ten years old, and it was written by um, Kilminster, published in um, Medical Education, and it. If you look at this, it has very, very little relevance to general practice supervision. And that's because 10 years ago, there was very little written on this. But I still like this definition, even though it pertains to supervision across health professional education. And again, if I had um, the luxury of asking you, I'd ask you to pick out the key words in that definition. But for me, it's the breadth of guidance around personal, professional and educational development. So it's not just education. I think a lot of supervisors who start out think, oh my, you know, I'm just going to be overwhelmed with trying to educate. I don't know anything about women's health as a male GP in my 60s. Or um, are they going to ask me, you know, how about, about procedural medicine? So, um, so it is beyond education. Um, and it's certainly the personal professional development. But the other element of that is your role as supervisors in providing safe and effective care. And I guess you really can't um, separate those two. One uh, about education and one about patient safety. And I'll touch on that a little bit more as we go. There's a very experienced supervisor, uh, medical educator that many of you will know, Susan Wern, and she did a review of supervision with a much greater focus on general practice supervisors. And she writes in a paper that she published, a GP supervisor is a general practitioner who establishes and maintains an education alliance that supports the clinical, educational and personal development of a resident. Again, I think a great definition. Uh, it just misses that notion of oversight of safe and effective care of patients, which I like. And I guess is, is for many supervisors, foremost in the way they, they, they supervise. So there has been quite a bit of stuff around um, general practice training and teaching. And a couple of slides. So I guess when I, and again, when I, when I uh, talk, uh, to supervisors when I talk to registrars, I sometimes like to go behind the scenes a bit. There's some comedians called, uh, magicians at least, or comedians as well, Penn and Teller. I don't know if anyone knows them, but they have a show where they sort of unpack their magic tricks. And I like, as I go, to say what I'm doing, so, so maybe that's something you can apply too. So I always tend to try to start with a little bit of uh, literature, a little bit of theory, which if you always, if you say to somebody, I'm going to start with some theory, they, they'll switch off, but hopefully contextualising it. So there is a little bit around this that I thought I'd share with you. Um, <clears throat> and these are the top five attributes of the good GP trainer. You can see this has come out of Holland or out of Britain where um, they use the word trainer as opposed to supervisor. Uh, and again, those may resonate really nicely with you. Honesty. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, but I was thinking about the word honesty um, and, and well, surely we're all trustworthy, surely we all are going to be honest with our registrars. What does that mean? Um, for me, that's honesty about identifying knowledge gaps. So saying, look, really, as a term two registrar, I'm a little bit surprised that you weren't aware of that. Let's talk about your experience in that area. I mean, honesty about performance, so when you're sitting in with a registrar, if you're doing random case analysis, if you're giving feedback, honesty about uh, not um, colluding with the registrar in poor performance, but actually being very really frank and fearless in what you've, um, what you've seen. And I guess honesty in an emotional state as well. Uh, I'm in many ways an anxious practitioner. Um, I struggle with a lot of what we do and see as GPs. 
and I um, I try to be honest about that. Uh, I am honest about my shortcomings in particular areas in women's health, in in you know high level procedural stuff. And so I think registrars respond to that, and that's this whole notion of articulating. I think that I talked about earlier. Certainly, in terms of feedback by registrars, the big thing they say is availability. My supervisor was available. Um, they always gave me a phone number. I always knew where to, to um, get in touch with them. So availability is, um, well, it's, it's clearly a, a hugely important thing. I'm not going to go through all those. You can read them yourself. But um, obviously, you're, to be a supervisor, you need to be clinically sound. And um, we hope you're committed. And we hope these sorts of sessions will increase that commitment. And this is another study, but sort of parallel themes. But the, way, the reason I like to point this out is that of the top five core characteristics of the competent GP trainer, two of them relate to feedback. And again, as a medical educator working in a GP training program, if there's one thing that registrars uh, will cr be critical of their experience in a practice, it's, I just didn't get feedback. And they're often the registrars who, pour, who perform either averagely well or very well. So again, it's not a trick, it's not even a tip, but it's a take home message. Build feedback into your, um, your supervision early and regularly. So as I said, there's five themes um, I wanted to cover. And uh, the roles of the supervisor. Now, this is the first paper I think I put together around supervision about 10 years ago. In fact, when I was in Ireland, I was chipping away as the rain fell uh, through the winter um, on my ideas about what supervisors, their roles and responsibilities might be. And it's it's probably just, outdated. Just through, the, just through the winter there, are you, are you being honest about the rain in Ireland or what? <laughs> I, my, I had a slide, Glenn, um, which I took out because it made the PowerPoint too large to to send to you. But um, it was the uh, a weather guide to the next sort of week in in the where we were in County Donegal, and it was just rain every day and the same temperature every day, it was like six and rain. And I thought, why didn't they just like put a really big one and have six and rain? But yes, it was it was good good place to to, to try to write certainly. And so you're welcome to have a look at this. It's in Australian Family Physician. It's a little bit old now, but I think hopefully covers some themes. And it was this notion of what are your what are your roles? How do you separate them out? And again, if I had you in a small group, I'd I'd ask these things, but I'll I'll tease them out for you. The first one, and I think a really important one, is, is to be a mentor. And I guess you hear that all the time. Um, it's important to be a mentor. And um, I'd ask. Then, if there's any uh, Greek scholars in the audience, because <clears throat> somebody tends to know what this is. But let me read you a little bit about who Mentor was. He was a wise and faithful friend of Ulysses, king of Ithaca. When he departed for the siege of Troy, when Ulysses departed for the siege of Troy, he entrusted to Mentor his infant son Telemachus and his wife Penelope. Mentor was largely responsible for the child's education, the shaping of his character, the installation of values, and later the wisdom of his decisions. So a mentor was a figure in Greek mythology, and it's a term we, I guess, bandy around a lot, but a really, really important role, sub-role of your role as GP supervisors. And again, if there's a tip for this, um, it's to embrace it and to articulate it and to say the words uh, if, if it's appropriate. Clearly the relationship may not be such that the mentor um, connection occurs. But explicitly, I would like to mentor you. I, I would like to see myself as a mentor for your time in our practice. And that just allows the connection to develop. Uh, if, you, if that feels awkward or cheesy, then just give it a go and just say, I heard that on a webinar and sorry, I know that sounded crazy, but, um, but I, I think it actually makes the relationship a little more uh, explicit. Um, there is a difference between role modelling and mentorship. Mentorship, I think, is a lot more interactive. It's a lot more one-on-one -on -one and, 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 uh, and close. You can be a role model uh, and not really have much to do with somebody. Um, in fact, you can have you can be a role model and not have have very little. Yeah, it's very passive. 
I, I told myself I wouldn't look at the comments because I'd get wildly distracted, but I think I'm half managing here. Um, absolutely. So again, and then this is my first attempt at uh, sort of semi-interaction. So this is a quote by a role model. You tried your best and you failed miserably. The lesson is never try. So does anyone know who actually said that? And there's always one, and there's a big group tonight, so I expect there might be more than one. And the perverse thing is, this is the sort of character that you might think, well, this person's hardly going to be a role model. How sad and boring. I hope that's not referring to me, um, and, but, but to the quote. Uh, but this, this actual individual, no, it wasn't Trump. <laughs> uh, this individual is actually written up as um, uh, somebody who is genuinely a role model for his children and for many, and I mean, it just seems perverse. I haven't seen the response yet. Can you think? He's a cartoon character. And it's actually Homer Simpson. Um, and if you don't believe me, I haven't got the reference here, but there was a fantastic um, little paper written about that he's always actually in the end of the show, even though he's a sort of drunk and, 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 and a, an oath. Um, he's there for his kids and he kind of brings the, brings the family together. So, look, don't think of Homer Simpson when you think about role model, but just think as, you're, as, as um, yourselves, you are role models. And that, again, if there's a tip in that, it's that what you do, your registrars will model. Um, the way you order pathology, the way you interact with staff, the way you follow up results, those things registrars will model. And obviously, we see and hope you're all sound clinicians, but if you think, oh, you know, um, there are areas that uh, I wouldn't wish others to uh, practice like I do. Well, be aware that registrars will be observing and potentially modelling that behaviour. Now, clearly we're not going to talk about a supervisor role without mentioning your educator role. As I say, when, when <clears throat> supervisors start, that's the big thing and they think, how am I going to do this? How am I going to teach registrars? And I guess many respects, when a registrar is highly competent, they, they, and I hear this very often, and you've probably said it yourselves, I don't know how I'm going to teach this individual anything, they're just brilliant. This slide is, is, is I really like. I found it somewhere, um, and I don't even know, it wasn't anything to do, I think, with GP training, but it's great. And it refers to trying to find this notion of a learning edge for your registrar. And clearly, um, and I think I can use a pencil, let's see how that goes, Glenn. Uh, pencil, there you go. So, that's a bit messy, isn't it? Ineffective due to anxiety. Um, so as a task gets more difficult up here and a registrar isn't very competent, they'll be overwhelmed um, by anxiety and they won't learn. On the other quadrant, um, if it's an incredibly um, simple task but they are and highly competent at it, they're going to become bored. Uh, oh, there you go. Somebody knows more about it than I do. Yerkes Dodson Curve. Thank you, Rolf T. Um, so the idea is to always push your. Um, I feel like uh, Peter Sterling now in the state of origin. There you go. There's a there's an arrow. Um, always push your learners to this learning edge. Now that's much much harder to do than I've just illustrated here. Um, but if you again, as a concept, as a tip, as a trick, think about. Am I, do, is my registrar operating on the learning edge? Have I pushed them into an area of anxiety because they're just not competent at the, um, the work they're doing? Or are they actually sitting there bored with what they're seeing because they're not being challenged sufficiently? Another paper that I um, put together, which was a bit of fun, and partly because there's nothing else on it in the literature, so it makes the uh, reference list small, was around supervising the highly performing registrar. We won't have a chance to go into that tonight, but again, have a look at um, if, you, if, you're, if you've got highly performing registrars or you'd like a few tips around that, uh, and it covers some of the areas when, when you've got somebody who you think is, is really uh, excelling in many of the areas of general practice, even as a registrar. So as an educator, we'll come back to that, but um, that's the really uh, nice, um, I think, model that I'd like you to take away. Then there's the assessor role. 
And again, if we had an hour, what I'd be doing is teasing out these roles. I'd be saying, where do the conflicts lie? And certainly one of the really big conflicts uh, in your role as supervisors is this role uh, conflict between the assessor, somebody providing formative assessment, giving potentially um, harsh or, or uh, quite um, you know, strong feedback about performance, and also the educator or mentor role where you're trying to support and try to um, enthuse. And so it is sometimes very difficult. Uh, the, we'll talk a lot more or well, a little bit more about um, feedback. Um, one, again, the tip I would raise here, uh, there's a couple, I guess. One is when your registrar start in the practice, I won't talk about orientation explicitly, but um, Glenn very kindly sent me the new supervisor uh, guide, which has just been released, and there's quite an, uh, a section in there on a comprehensive orientation and the role of that. And again, for me, that's critical. But one of the things I'd really emphasise early on, again, articulate the words. Here in this practice, uh, you will receive a lot of feedback. Uh, I'm not going to sit down with you at the midpoint and the end point of the term and <clears throat> tell you how I think you're going. I will aim to give you feedback along the way. If I'm not doing that sufficiently, please ask me for feedback and I would like you to give me feedback. I want you to give me feedback on my clinical performance and my teaching. That's getting a little bit kind of edgy. Oh, do I really want them to tell me how I'm going? And registrars, when I say this to them, say there's no way I could tell my supervisor this stuff. But again, make it explicit make it open, make it two-way learning, and you will reap the rewards. So that notion of this practice, the way our relationship will work, is um, just, just uh, par for the course. This is the way I would like to operate. The other really important thing I think that I hope to be able to instill in you tonight, if, you, um, if you're not doing it already, is to not just use the words reflective learning, but to really sort of uh, think on what it means and really try to get registrars to practice this. Again, there's lots written on this and you could lose yourself in the literature. But um, if there's a mechanism where registrars, and you'll see this, you'll see the registrars turn up to work, check their results, plough through their patients, have their lunch, plough through the afternoon and head off home. And fantastic, you know, they're doing a good job, they're, um, the patients are happy, the receptionists love them because they're on time. But you sometimes think, how much are they actually stopping and reflecting on their performance? So again, part of your feedback can be uh, mechanisms to discuss reflective learning. And of the five sort of roles, uh, and certainly it is last, but it's not least. And in fact, when Glenn was saying, look, Simon, it'd be really nice for you to cover these two or three things, I said, oh, well, I'm already covering pastoral care role. And I, I, you, you know, the focus on a registrar's social and emotional well-being, um, again, can be extraordinarily important. Many registrars, it's fine. But others, uh, and as a medical educator looking after hundreds of registrars, you know, we've had registrars and you have probably had similar experiences who have had marriage breakdowns, who have been relocated to your practice from uh, a, an urban centre, leaving their family behind, who've got significant illness in the family, who, who are grieving, all those things. Um, you have a role, I believe, to, to understand and support. Um, so uh, the, other, the other side of that, or the other part of that, I think is to if you're in a, you know, if, if you've got a good relationship, is to share some of your own frustrations, um, share some of your own uh, experiences, as as much as you feel comfortable. And again, it's that sort of personal side that registrars often really value. The paper I wrote a few years ago goes into a whole bunch of others, um, other roles, which I'm not going to cover here. One of them as an employer, and clearly that's a massive conflict potentially for. Um, your role in trying to mentor and support registrars when you're actually employing them and, and potentially having to talk to them about punctuality or, or uh, their dress or whatever. I guess the big tip there is to use your practice managers effectively to, um, to cover some of that stuff. 
Glenn, can I just check you're still there and um, we're ticking along okay? I can hardly hear you, Marissa, sorry. Everything oh, good, good. Well. Sorry, it is that. Thank oh, good, thank you. Uh, gone for dinner there. <laughs> Very good. I know it's, it is that sense of I'm sitting here in my study, which I've just set up to uh, do this sort of thing. Um, thinking it all feels very, uh, <clears throat> very odd. I could said like that speaking to your mobile phone for half an hour before you realise that uh, your friends left. But anyway, good. I'm glad you're still with me. So, so they're the roles. Um, let's just take a uh, another look at um, this sort of. I guess in many respects theoretical, but uh, in, in, in others practical separation between clinical and ed educational supervision. The way I like to think of it, clinical supervision um, is, uh, is the patient safe, educational supervision is the learner learning. And again, there's clearly a very big overlap there, but the way that the literature sometimes paints these is that they're, they're quite separate entities. So again, just to reinforce, and clearly all these definitions could be um, <clears throat> uh, changed and somebody else might say something quite different. But here's one, um, guide the registrar's improvement by identifying needs, planning learning, acting a resource and providing feedback and assessment. The sorts of things we've just talked about in your roles. And clinical supervision, as we touched on, clinical oversight of the management of a registrar's patient's um, quality of care and patient safety. So this slide um, actually by chance, but a, a very um, appropriately, uh, the first line there, are they safe in there, is the um, title of an article by Patrick Burns, who's a supervisor uh, in Queensland. I think it is one of now, where did I see that? Maybe one of the references as part of this webinar, but it's a really, really nice paper. And I, again, written in a style, two or three pages long, incredibly accessible, practical, and, and one I'd encourage you to read if you haven't already. And then I guess this gets on to, so are the, are the registrars safe in there, and how can I be sure, um, is this notion of a registrar coming from an environment. and I remember hearing this at a talk recently and it struck me that I hadn't really entertained this as much as I had previously, but they come out of the medical school one, two, well at least two, three, four, however many years in the hospital setting where they're very much part of a team. I mean, as you know, you can't um, sign a medical chart without um, the registrar ever looking at and they really don't get to do much um, until they turn up in general practice, they're behind a closed door. They're, as somebody said to me the other day, the most dangerous um, tool a doctor ever wields is a pen, which I thought was fantastic. So they can write requests for referrals and tests and imaging, um, they write scripts, and you want to know if they're one of the if they're the fifth doctor. Um, uh, it's a bit like that sort of dental commercial. And this slide always reminds me when I worked up in the Northern Territory. Um, and again, this is probably going to fall totally flat because I won't know if you think it's even remotely um, interesting. But um, a patient, I rang a patient once about some results and um, we, we, I told her what was going on. And then at the, at the end of the call, she said to me, Doctor, I just wanted to ask you if, if, if everything's all right. And I said, I'm sorry? She said, I, I, I just couldn't help noticing that when I saw you last week, you were unshaven and your shirt was all wrinkly and, and, and clearly hadn't been ironed. And I thought, oh my goodness, and I just moved up to the Northern Territory and I think I tried to adopt this kind of territory style. I don't think I was in thongs and I certainly wasn't smoking, but um, I'd taken on the, uh, the NT persona a little too assiduously, I think, and so I had to tell her, no, I wasn't sleeping in the car and it was all good, and, um, but thanks for her care. So, um, so it's not a great sign just the way your registrar might look, but you do want to know that they're safe. So again, if, you had, if I had a dozen of you in a room, I'd, I'd brainstorm this, but uh, let's... Um, <laughs> uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I 
thank you. I'm, I am keeping up with these comments. So what methods can we use to supervise our registrars? And again, I'd, I'd get you to, to throw all your suggestions out. Um, so instead of that, I've, I've made a list and I guess we haven't got loads of time, so I'll move through. And I'll, I'll just touch on these. There's lots written about some of these and I'll just give you my tips and tricks for some of them. I guess the first one is direct observation, sitting in with a registrar, either them sitting in with you, but more importantly, you sitting in with them. And the thing as an educator that always strikes me is that how many super, uh, registrars can get through a term in, in, in general practice and not have anyone sit in on them. And I know some supervisors will find that extraordinary and others it, it happens. And um, in terms of identifying a registrar's clinical gaps, in terms of identifying patient safety, it is the most powerful, clearly. So I would encourage regular uh, direct observation, even if it's for 50, one patient here and there. Um, you don't have to do a teaching visit for a whole session. So make that regular and be brave and make the registrar squirm, but do video consultation review. It is such a powerful tool for um, <clears throat> appraising performance and giving feedback. Uh, clearly you'll be seeing lots of your registrar's notes. You'll be reviewing how um, what they're doing by way of their clinical care. Um, but random case analysis, again, a, a topic that very little was written about. But random case analysis, again, a topic that very little was written about, certainly in the Australian context, and Jared Ingham and I put together a paper a few years ago now um, on this, is really one of the most extraordinarily powerful ways of exploring a registrar's clinical knowledge and skills, teaching around clinical reasoning, obviously looking at their record keeping. So if you're not doing it, and many of you or some of you may have seen me talk about this, I'd really encourage it. It's a fantastic tool. Um, no t I think Jared's actually giving a session on this in a month or so, so if you're interested, go along. Lots of other things, staff and patient feedback. Traffic, again, a paper that I wrote and will be published in AFP very soon, and that's <clears throat> to support my strong interest in um, rational use of pathology tests. It stands for test result audit and feedback. So really looking at a registrar's pathology tests. So let's have a look at Mrs. Smith's tests. That's fascinating. Why did you order that TSH? Tell me about her presentation. Why is it relevant? What are you going to do with his abnormal results? So a really good way of supervising and teaching a registrar. You'll do lots of formal teaching, you'll quarantine teaching time. I guess the tip there is to, as you, those of you who are doing it, do it at a time that well, you, can, you can stick to after lunch. Um, uh, that doesn't, you know, first thing in the morning is, tends to be the best. Teaching around critical incidents and procedural teaching. Um, so uh, that's this notion of um, the breadth of potential um, uh, supervision methods. And again, Glenn, <laughs> thank you, Christopher H. Uh, I, I, I had that on my door for for years, and I must say, I looked at it, and it confused me even more as to whether I should push up my door. So yeah, I, I, it's great. Um, now this doesn't mean this particular individual, as you know. Uh, is, is um, potentially a, a struggling registrar. They might be highly gifted, but they just don't know um, uh, whether to push or pull a door. I heard something on the radio, and it was um, simple things that confused people. It was about people arriving at the airport, and they were, they were arriving, but they needed to go to departures, and they were getting confused. And similarly, I never know whether the, the, the triangles pointing away from each other towards each other mean that lift doors open or close and I always have to sort of mentally go through it. So so um, anyway, there's quite a bit written about the struggling registrar. Um, there's a little bit written on the highly performing registrar as I, as I referred to earlier. Uh, and I put together for a presentation once a quiz that included this question. Um, this, the C there, or the half C, stands for collaboration, and the blobogram in the middle actually refers to the trials that were done looking at using steroids in premature babies and the fact that the meta-analysis, which happened 10 years after the early trials, which showed no effect, the meta-analysis showed that was, there was a significant effect. So in fact, it's all about using evidence, using um, <clears throat> big data to um, 
to, to uh, base our clinical decisions on. So this, these two slides really are about identifying the, the learner you've got early. How do you do that? How do you identify learning needs? Um, there's a, again a range of things to do. There's nothing better than to sit them down, ask them about their strengths and weaknesses, ask them about their experience. But again, the tip for, that I would like for you to take away from this um, session tonight is, is trying to get your registrar to identify their unknown unknowns. And as my t-shirt um, in the opening slide shows, and this is the one off the internet, we are all, and we all should be proudly, unconsciously incompetent. We must be comfortable with the fact that there's lots we don't know that we don't know. And it's our role as supervisors and educators for, to uh, help support a registrar identify those areas. So we know registrars um, have conscious incompetence. They know um, there's things they don't know, but they often feel embarrassed or awkward or think they can sort of get through it and don't approach us. But there's also lots of areas they don't know they don't know, the, the Rumsfeldisms, <clears throat> that it's, your, it's our job to identify. And it's really revealing and really rewarding for yourselves and for registrars when you tap into those uh, and, and allow a registrar to pursue learning in that area. <clears throat> so the Johari window, um, named after two educators, Joe and Harry, and that's completely true, uh, is this talks about the, um, the four areas. And the yellow box, the unknown by the self, unknown by the registrar, and unknown by others, unknown by the supervisors, is the area that you know, I, I would like you to think about when you're teaching your registrars. The other, I guess, tip around teaching um, uh, is to think beyond, and this is particularly important for the highly performing registrar. If you've got somebody struggling, really you're wanting to make sure they're safe, give them the clinical knowledge and support. But somebody who's really performing well or, or just you just want to challenge, think about the breadth of general practice. Registrars will focus necessarily or naturally on domain two, applied professional knowledge and skills. That's what they'll be assessed in the exam predominantly on. But, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of opportunities to assess communication skills as we've talked about. Um, population health, uh, so screening and, you know, uh, out of the consultation type activities. Professional and ethical role and you can have some fantastic discussions one of the tips I would suggest you do is as you work and you see not just interesting clinical cases but interesting professionalism cases or ethical challenges that you come across, make a note, write it down and put it in your drawer so that when you've got a teaching session and you want to cover something ethical, you're talking about a real case and the real challenges that you're opposed with. And again, the other tip around this is you may not know the answer. When you're teaching, it doesn't matter if you don't, if you don't know the answer. Just say, we'll look it up together. And of course, there's um, the last domain, organisation and legal. Uh, so we're talking about, I guess, planning learning, which is the third element of what, um, <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about. Uh, by identifying a registrar's strengths and weaknesses, looking at their past experience, um, obviously reviewing their notes as you go and identifying gaps, but um, very uh, effectively using random case analysis to identify their unknown unknowns, hopefully. And again, a little model we put together when we wrote the random case analysis stuff, which I would really encourage you to use if you haven't seen or you're not doing, and it's great fun and it's really uh, a good way to extend your registrars is to use why and what if questions, particularly the what if questions. So this is to develop clinical reasoning, which many would argue is your key role as supervisors. It's to help your registrar think like a GP um, and to, to clinically reason, similar to what the experts do like you and I, hopefully. So lots of, thanks Danny B, lots of, uh, lots of why questions. And again, you may not have the answers uh, when you're probing, but it's all right. You can look this stuff up together or say, look, I have gaps too. So 
why did you order that particular test? Why do you think the patient came today? Um, why did you use that particular treatment? Why did you suggest coming back in two weeks uh, as opposed to one week? Um, but then you've explored, well that's the kind of the basis for their thinking and their clinical reasoning, but then the what ifs. And this is where it gets, you know, so what if this patient's presentation was different in that what if they were 85? How would that have changed your management? What if they were Aboriginal? Do you think that would have made you think of a different differential? Um, what, what led you to? Thank you, that's a good suggestion. Um, what, uh, what if the system was different? What if you actually were working out in Walgett where you didn't have a CAT scanner um, up the hill? Um, would, that have, would you have done anything differently there? Uh, what if you hadn't missed that ectopic two weeks ago? Um, do you think you know, do you think this really warranted an ultrasound? So have fun exploring. Um, obviously within the, the domain of not wanting to be too threatening or intimidating because um, you know it can take a case, uh, particularly things like ethically, what if this patient was 13 and pregnant, you know? Well, I'm not sure what to do either, but it doesn't matter. We can we can talk about it. So I think hopefully a useful tip. So that, that's the, this notion of planning learning. For opportunistic teaching, which I'll touch on um, briefly, I like this uh, idea of a, that, of a teaching moment. And again, uh, using those words, having those words available and, and even saying to a registrar, I will try to identify teaching moments for you. Because they may say to you, we haven't, have we had any teaching moments? And you can say, yeah, that was one last week, do you remember? Uh, so a teaching moment, and they happen all the time, is clearly when a registrar rings or knocks on your door and says, um, I've, got, uh, I've got a problem, can you help me? And it might be that you're busy or that it demands an urgent and quick response, but it might be, um, no, I've got two minutes here. Uh, when it says one minute precept, I always think that's complete that that's just not true. Um, there's a link there which I'll ask you to have a look at um, perhaps afterwards and it takes longer than a minute so it's a, it's a bit of a misnomer. But in a couple of minutes you can easily, hello Glenn. Hey, how uh, you You can easily, good, you've got a question. I do, I do. The question is, you've talk, spoken a lot um, in uh, the first person and about uh, what a, a supervisor can do but I'm just wondering about the, the rest of the team in terms of group teaching and things like that, in terms of opportunistic teaching? Uh, well, yeah, look, um, <clears throat> what, what the first thing I would say that I think is really important for every registrar to have a sense of um, that who their primary supervisor is. I think it's fantastic to have a number of supervisors in a practice and a number of, of uh, GPs who offer teaching there's a lot of expertise in a practice, as you'd be aware, and um, you know why not send the registrar to the non-supervisor down the hallway who can do the procedural stuff better than you. But but I think registrars really value knowing this is this is where the buck stops with this particular individual or individuals perhaps if there's a couple. But Glenn's I think referring to this idea of team-based teaching. Um, it is. You know, it shouldn't all fall on your shoulders unless you want it to. Um, there's plenty of scope to use other members in the in the practice team, certainly practice nurses, um, uh, practice manager if they're interested in learning about the business of a practice. We are located next to a pharmacy and it's quite legitimate as part of a teaching time for them to spend some time with the pharmacist, again, if that's a need and they're interested in doing it. Um, so I guess, uh, like there's a breadth of supervision and teaching methods, there's a breadth of potential um, teachers in a practice to um, to support teaching. Is that what you're wanting to touch on, Glenn? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But also, I'm thinking um, uh, vertical integration as well uh, as yeah. the, the horizontal stuff. So different grades of uh, uh, medical students, registrars, registrars at different stages potentially, um, all contributing to um, that learning. Yeah, and I know some practices do that extraordinarily well. I mean, to a point where I, there seems to be some magic dust sort of blowing through the air conditioning because I just, it's unfathomable how well it happens. It seems like they've got this vertical model 
um, so effectively working that the you know the, the students learning from the PD Triple P intern when when they existed from the registrar from the, the supervisor. Others less so, but I think absolutely you, I, I think senior registrars teaching junior registrars or certainly registrars taking students, that sort of peer teaching works really well. So in terms of the, the tips for opportunistic teaching, I think think about teaching moments. If you have a teaching moment, use this one minute preceptor model, that's a terrible terrible American kind of academic term, which I only put there because I wanted to point out that it takes longer than a minute, but it doesn't take much longer than a minute. And the five points of it, and you'll forget these as soon as we finish, but um, it's worth going through. So get a commitment. What do you, what do you think? What do you want to do? Um, before you say what you think and what you want to do, tell, get the registrar to make sure they tell you. Ask for some supporting evidence. So why do you think that? Tell me a bit more about the case and some of the bloods and you know what, what supports the, um, the reasons for that. You might teach some general rules, reinforce what was um, done right and correct mistakes. So that, again, you have a look at the, the website there. If you're not doing something, a version of that, have a think about it. But if you forget all that and you just want to remember um, that thing Simon mentioned about opportunistic teaching, it's basically asking before telling. And we're so often as experts and often um, as uh, uh, in, in, in a busy practice, we just want to say, oh, look, you're great, so bang, 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 bang. But if you just ask, you tell me what you think, what do you think is going on before you, um, you actually give the information, that's, that's as good as um, you could go, I reckon. So isn't that awful? Feedback always gets done last. That's um, <laughs> maybe the way of it. But uh, there's this great paradox with feedback. There's a great paradox with direct observation in that we all know how effective it is. Oh, sorry, video, video in particularly. Um, but everyone hates it, so it doesn't happen. Um, feedback's the same thing. The evidence says it encourages self-reflection, raises self-awareness, helps students plan, identifies learning needs, all those sorts of things really well. But the paradox is uh, in that um, trainees want it to happen. Actually, if you ask supervisors, they say, yeah, it's really important to do. And um, we know it's effective. But so often it's not frequently or effectively given. So again, if there's a take home message, it's right at the start nurture that sort of learning environment of your practice, uh, focus on the, um, on the fact that you'll be giving a lot of feedback, encourage this two-way feedback, so I want to know how I'm going, I want you to give me feedback, I want you to tell me if you don't think you're getting enough feedback, um, and uh, you'll, you'll just develop, it'll just happen naturally in that way. So clearly there are times that you might need to give uh, more direct feedback. It is important that you base feedback on um, performance. It has to be on what you've observed. And that might be observed in the notes, but certainly if you've observed a registrar, what they're doing. As I talked about right at the beginning, clear goals. So you want to try to work out what you're actually going to get out from it. And it is most appropriately done at you know at the right time and the right space. And you've all heard stories of people getting negative feedback or difficult feedback in the corridor when people are walking by. So certainly, if it's not if it's something more substantial, make sure it's quarantined. You've all been to sessions on feedback. You know this stuff backwards, but I guess it is important to um, just don't fall into those pitfalls. Feedback should happen pretty soon after you've observed the performance. It should be very specific. I observed you do this. Don't, it's not about judgment. It's not you were too harsh with that patient or you, seen, you were um, <clears throat> critical about their, the fact they hadn't lost weight. I observed you say, write things down. If, if, there's, if there's another really important tip, is if you're sitting in, if you're doing video, it's write quotes down because quotes are irrefutable. This is what you said. This is what the patient said. Let's talk about that. Clearly try to be constructive and I think my next, um, uh, well, I'll come to that. Um, appropriate setting, certainly as we'll talk about in terms of Pendleton's rules, the registrar must be able to um, talk for at least half the time. Focus on the behaviour and be positive. Um, and so 
the pitfalls is that we are very good at giving positive feedback and we are too, very, very poor, I think, at giving negative feedback and we always try to focus on the positives. So if be f uh, fearless uh, and frank in your feedback, that's an important message. Um, you all know this, but it's extraordinary how often this doesn't happen as well as it might. So always, again, you can remember these dot points, but essentially ask the registrar first what they think they did well before you say and ask them what they think they could have done differently before you. And if they can't think of anything they did well, say, no, so I'll stop you there. Let's get into the difficult stuff later, but I want to know what you thought you did well because they've always done something well. Um, and that's the most simple model of feedback, I guess, the, the, uh, the positive sandwich. So I, um, I, this has fallen flat many, many times for me when <clears throat> you, you, you give, deliver the negative feedback and then you struggle to think of something to finish on, and, um, but that's one that you've seen used. Now it is 8.56. Uh, we all wait for the bus. <laughs> yes, it's too true. Um, and I don't know if it's getting phased out. Uh, Glenn didn't like my original sandwich, so he's put something a bit more healthy looking in um, uh, and that might remind everyone that they probably are due to have dinner or um, uh, if, if they've had dinner, it's been an hour since they've had dinner. Uh, what I always like to do... I think, I'm so, what, sorry, if, if I can add something there. I think one of the critiques of the, the sandwich uh, method is that sometimes um, putting a negative between two positives in ending on a positive, the message is lost. Yep. And so I guess the, the, the challenge there for a supervisor has to be that the registrar will take away the things that they need to work on in that particular moment. Yeah, uh, and as Rosemary's written, um, uh, we all wait for the but. Victor T says set go. Look, there's a whole range of models. I'm not sure if you've got the flavour from my talk tonight. Glenn said, and um, with respect, Glenn said, you know, maybe talk a little bit about learning styles. And I said, you know what, I'm not a fan of learning styles. Um, I, I have referred to the literature a little bit, um, but I'm actually not a great fan of some of the, the theoretical basis of this. If you are, fantastic, and I think there's a lot of um, important uh, uses of that, but it's never actually served me hugely well. Um, so I guess this is a bit more homespun, but hopefully it's been of some value. What I always like to do with a session, and I would encourage you to do in your teaching, is to do what I've just done here, and um, that is uh, <clears throat> finish with what you intended to happen. So um, you know, here's my learning objectives, and it allows the, the learner, if you're giving a talk in this case, but if, if you're giving a session, this is what I hope to get out of it. Have we covered those things? And if we had an, another bit of time, you know, you can cover the things that you haven't. So, um, any other questions? Glenn, I don't know how promptly you like people to finish um, these things. I guess people are keen to get away, but um, happy to take any. And I hope that's been of some value. I guess this is a distillation of a bunch of stuff that I've done over the last 15 years. I've used it for new supervisor workshops um, and um, hopefully some of it's practical. Much of it will be. I actually looked up um, what uh, the origin of the phrase teaching your grandmother to suck eggs. <clears throat> um, before I came on and I couldn't really find it. It's something to do with pricking a hole and sucking out the contents and I didn't want to um, teach you how to suck eggs but hopefully uh, I've given you you know, a, a bit of a sense of, of the things that you're doing and hopefully uh, a, um, an opportunity to look up some of those resources. Absolutely. Listen, thanks very much uh, for your time tonight, Simon. We have uh, n not a huge number of questions, so you, now's the chance if you have a specific question that you wanted to ask. Um, but if not, thank you all very, very much for attending. It has been the hour and obviously it's after hours, after a, a very long day. It's been a question here from um, uh, Nicole as to whether this PowerPoint and the recording will be available online. 
yes, we will absolutely send out anybody that registered for the session, including those that weren't able to make it, uh, will get a copy of both the PowerPoint and uh, the recording. We've also got a, a number of other resources that are currently being updated, so we'll get out the uh, guide for new supervisors as well and uh, watch this space. There's a number of different resources that are being developed at the moment, including uh, conversations with a number of uh, medical educators, both past and present, around the trap. So it's an exciting time, lots of uh, uh, changed boundaries and different providers and, and people that have moved on to, to different things. Lots and lots of experience out there and uh, it's all very positive out on the ground. So thank you very much again for your support. 110 people is not bad for a, a webinar after hours in your own time. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed the webinar and obviously we'd love your feedback. It's the way that we ensure that uh, your experience is um, is top notch, and we certainly do look at that that particular feedback. We've just sent the email out to everybody that uh, attended, so if you've got a moment before you uh, grab that beer at beer o'clock, I saw somebody say, um, then we'd love to have that feedback as well. Well, thank you very much too, and can I we put should a plug acknowledge in for um, the next webinar um, if you're interested on random case Absolutely. analysis, because that I think. That's really practical, and um, you'll you'll learn a lot from Jared. Absolutely. So the random case analysis is uh, next month. There'll be a, a promotion that comes out next week, starting with that. And uh, we'd also like to thank, obviously, uh, the Australian government who fund GPSA, but also. Uh, all of our sponsors who really make uh, all of these types of resources possible and available to supervisors. So once, an, once again, thank you all very much for attending and uh, thank you very much, Simon, for your time tonight. And I know uh, you've had a long day practicing, as is every, everybody else here today. So thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again in the future. Thank you very much. It's been good. Thanks. Thanks all. Thank you.